Scores of four-wheel drives have just arrived from Libya at the checkpoint of the city of Agadez in central Niger. Western Africa's gateway to the Sahara. Every week, convoys like this one travel both ways, crossing the thousand kilometers of desert that separate the two countries. These travelers are exhausted after a five-day journey. Many are Nigerian workers fleeing renewed violence in Libya, but many others are migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. When we get to Libya, they lock us up. And when we work, we don't get paid. What happened? We can't describe it. We can't tell everything because it's so bad. Most of them have tried to cross the Mediterranean to reach Europe. We paid for it, but we never went. They caught us and locked us up. I want to go home now. That's my hope. Mohammed organized this convoy. This former Tuareg rebel is a well-known figure in Agadez's migration business, a long-standing, flourishing activity that a law against irregular migration made illegal two years ago. Projects funded by the European Union were launched to offset the losses. But Mohammed refuses to give up his only source of income. I'm a smuggler. Even now I'm a smuggler. I've heard that in town they're giving us something, so we give up this job. But they didn't give me anything, and I don't know any other work than this one. We head to Agadez. These dozens of vehicles were confiscated from the smugglers who were arrested by the police, a symbol of the fight against irregular immigration. But that didn't go down well with the local population. The law hit the region's economy hard. Travelers departing for Libya were once Umaru's main source of revenue, but customers for his water cans are scarce now. Salam alaikum. The layoffs of workers after the closure of gold mines in the area did not help. Before, we sold four to 500 water cans every week to migrants, and cans were also sent to the mine. But they closed the road to Libya, they closed the mines, everything's closed. And these young people stay there without working or doing anything, without food. If they get up in the morning and they go to bed at night without eating anything, what will prevent them from one day going to steal something? Friday prayers are one of the few occasions when the city comes to life. We have an appointment that day with the president of the so-called Association for Former Migration Workers. He takes us to meet one of the former smugglers, who after stopping their activity have benefited from a new funded reconversion program. <laughs> Abdurrahman received a stock of chairs, pots and loudspeakers, which he rents out for celebrations. How's business going, OK? It's OK, more or less. It depends on God. I used to make much more money before. I could get up to 800 euros a week. Now it's barely 30 euros a week. Abdurrahman is nonetheless one of the luckiest. Out of 7,000 people listed as formerly involved in the migration business, less than 400 have so far benefited from the reconversion package, about 2,000 euros per project. Not enough to get by, says the head of the association. We respected the law. We're no longer working. We stopped. And now it's the state of Niger and the European Union which abandoned us. People are here, they have families, they have children, and they have nothing. We eat with our savings, the money we made before. That's what feeds us now, you see. It's really difficult. It's very hard for us. We meet Abdurrahman again the next morning. He's just delivered his equipment to one of his customers, also a former smuggler, who's now a taxi driver. Abba is celebrating the birth of his first child, a rare opportunity to forget his worries. Is 
Since it's a very wonderful day, it strengthened my heart to go and get chairs so that people, even if there's nothing, they can sit down if they come to your house. The times are hard for immigration now, but with the small funds we get, people can get by. It's going to be OK. Salut, bonjour. These kids are called the Talibé, or street kids, and the celebration is a chance for them to get some food since the anti smuggling law was implemented. There's more and more of them all over Agadez. The European Union has committed to spending more than 1 billion euros on development aid in a country classified as one of the poorest in the world. Niger is also one of the main beneficiaries of the European Emergency Fund created in 2015 to address migration issues in Africa. But for the vice president of the region of Agadez, these funds were only the bargaining chip for the law against irregular immigration, which in his eyes only serves the interests of Europe. Niger receives significant funding from the EU. Do you believe these funds are not used properly? First of all, the funding is insufficient. When we look at it, Turkey's received huge amounts of money, a lot more than Niger. And even armed groups in Libya received much more money than Niger. Today we're sitting here, we are the abyss of asylum seekers, refugees, migrants and displaced people. Agadez is an abyss. In the heart of the Sahel region, Niger is home to some 300,000 displaced people and refugees. They are a less and less transitory presence, which weighs on the region. This center, run by the International Organization for Migration, hosts migrants who've agreed to return to their home countries. But the procedures sometimes take months, and the center is saturated. 80% of the migrants, they don't have any identification. They don't have any documents. That means after registration, we have to go to the procedures of the travel authorization. And we have to coordinate this with the embassy and consul of each country. That is the main issue and the challenge that we are facing every day. We are around 1,000 people in this area, the area that's supposed to receive 400 to 500. All those mattresses are here because people sleep outside here. So because it's the over the capacity, many people are waiting on the other side. So we need to move those people quick as possible so we can let others come. Returning to their country is not an option for many of those who transit through Niger. Among them, several hundred Sudanese, supervised by the UNHCR, the UN Agency for Refugees. Many fled the conflict in Darfur and endured hell in Libyan detention centers. Some have been waiting for months for an answer to their asylum request. Bader Erdin dreams of completing his veterinary studies in the West. Since I finished my university in life, I, lost, I almost lost uh, the half of my life uh, uh, because of the wars, the uh, travelings from uh, Sudan to Libya. I don't want to lose my life again. So it's a time to start uh, my life. It's a time to work. It's a time to educate. So we're staying in Niger uh, for nothing or staying in Niger for long times for me, it's not good. Still, the only short-term perspective for these men is to escape the promiscuity of this reception center. Faced with the influx of asylum seekers, the UN has opened another site outside the city. We meet Ibrahim, also Sudanese, who spent years in refugee camps in Chad and then Libya. He's 20 years old. It was really very difficult, but thank God I'm alive. What I can say really is that since we cannot go back home, we're looking for a place that is more favorable to us, where we can be safe and have a better chance in life.
Hope for a better life is a closer perspective for those who've been evacuated from Libyan prisons as part of an emergency rescue plan launched last year by the UNHCR. Welcomed in Niamey, the capital of Niger, they must be resettled in third countries. After fleeing their country, Somalia, these women were tortured in Libyan detention centers. They're waiting for resettlement in France. There are many problems in my country, and I had my own. I have severe stomach injuries. The only reason I left my country was to escape from these problems, and I just wanted to find a safe place where I could find hope. People like me need hope. A dozen countries, most of them European, have pledged to welcome some 2,600 refugees evacuated from Libya to Niger. But less than 400 have so far been resettled. The solidarity is there. There has to be a sense of urgency also to re reinstall them, to uh, welcome them to the countries that have been offering these places. So it is important to avoid the long stay in Niger and that they continue their journey onwards. The slowness of the countries offering asylum to respect their commitments has disappointed the government of Niger. But what the interior minister most regrets is a lack of foresight of Europe when it comes to stemming irregular immigration. I'm rather in favour of more control, but I am especially in favour of seeing European countries working together to promote another relationship with African countries. A relationship based on issuing visas on the basis of the needs that can be expressed by companies in Europe. It is because this work is not done properly that we have finally accepted that the only possible migration is illegal migration. Estimated at five to 7,000 per week in 2015, the number of migrants leaving for Libya has fallen tenfold, according to the Niger authorities. But the trafficking continues on increasingly dangerous routes. The desert, it is said in Agadez, has become more deadly than the Mediterranean. We meet one of the smugglers who, for lack of alternatives, he says, has resumed his activities even if he faces years in prison. This law is as if we'd been gathered together and had knives put under our throats to slit our throats. Some of us were locked up, others fled the country, others lost everything. He takes us to one of the former transit areas where migrants were gathered before leaving for Libya when it was allowed. The building has since been destroyed. Customers are rarer, and the price of crossings has tripled. In addition to the risk of being stopped by the police and army patrols, travelers have to dodge attacks by arms and drug traffickers who roam the desert. Often the military are on a mission. They don't want to waste time. So sometimes they'll tell you, we can find an arrangement, what do you offer? We give them money to leave. We must also avoid bandits. There are armed people everywhere in the bush. We have to take detours to get around them. We know that it's dangerous, but for us the most dangerous thing is not being able to feed your family. That's the biggest danger. So now we're entering one of the circled ghettos outside Agadez, where the candidates to the trip to Europe through Libya hide out until smugglers pick them up. We're led to a house where a group of young people are waiting for their trip to be organized by their smuggler. They haven't eaten for two days. They've already tried to cross the desert, but were abandoned by their drivers fleeing army patrols. And they were saved just in time. Several of their fellow travelers died of thirst and exhaustion. 
The desert is a huge risk. There are many who have died, but people are not discouraged. Why are they coming? That's the question. All the time there are meetings between West African leaders and the leaders of the European Union to give out money so that the migrants don't get through. We say that's a crime. It's their interests that they serve, not the interests of our continent. To stop immigration, they should invest in Africa, in companies, so that young people can work. It's no use giving money to people or putting soldiers in the desert or removing all the boats on the Mediterranean to stop immigration. It won't help. It'll keep going on. There are thousands of young people who are ready to go always because there is nothing. There's nothing to keep them in their countries. When they think of the suffering of their families, when they think that they have no future, they will always be ready, ready for anything. They will always be ready to risk their lives.